Good afternoon, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to be here uh, at the first Palms International Conference at the, uh, hosted by the University of Peradeniya. And uh, as a proud alumna of the University of Peradeniya and the former Department of uh, Production Engineering, I am proud to be here in front of you uh, to share uh, some thoughts about production and operations management. So uh, when Asela reached out to me and uh, asked me to talk about, uh, make a presentation to the audience, I decided to pick a topic that we just started working on and uh, try to give you some inspiration to think about some emerging topics that could have an impact on production and operations management. So as uh, Asela mentioned, the topic that I'm going to talk about is manufacturing in the sharing economy and what opportunities and uh, challenges it may bring upon us. So to begin the discussion, I think we need to examine what is the sharing economy. Let me see if we can get this to come up. share pretty much everything. If you want to go for a, go to the beach for a day, you rent a minivan, rent a surfboard, and you know, get the room box, and even a dress you can rent nowadays. So what is the sharing economy? So the sharing economy is uh, if I, as an owner of an asset, as an owner of a product, uh, you have excess capacity, you have capacity that you're not using, and you, as a user, uh, of a product or a service or an ex uh, 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 let's say expertise, you are in need of this product or service or expertise on an as needed basis. You do not need this product for a long term or the service for the long term, but you need it just when you need it to be used for maybe an hour, an hour a day or a few days in a row. So the sharing economy is about uh, moving from uh, you know earning assets from a, to an economy we are looking at uh, providing access to using those assets. Uh, so that is, the, you know, if you have excess capacity in one place and there is a new demand for using that capacity on an as needed basis, you have a platform where you can share the capacity and meet the needs of these different populations. So looking at it in another context, so uh, the sharing economy is uh, where we have a become used to a preference to pay for assets or services by consumption or on demand. Okay? That is the operative word, consumption or on demand. We do not want to own the asset for a long time and just let it sit in some place, but you are looking to use uh, an asset or a service by consumption or whenever you need it, rather than owning the asset or uh, you know, entering into permanent long-term contracts. So that is the sharing economy that we are talking about. And uh, using the figure back again, uh, what this means is if you own assets and if you have excess capacity that is not being utilized, you become a supplier with excess capacity, right? And on the other hand, you are in need of a certain service, a product, or using of a certain design expertise. Uh, and um, so you become customers with on-demand access to assets and expertise. So these are the two sides of the two parties uh, that are primarily involved in the sharing economy. And then in the middle, we have the sharing platform that makes it possible for the people or the entities who have excess capacity to be able to share that excess capacity with individuals who are in need of a resource, a, a service, or a product when they want to use it. And all this, we you know, has been enabled by the platform, the internet-based platform that has developed rapidly over the last decade or so. Okay? So that is the sharing economy that we've been talking about. Uh, and it has become a streamlined process where we can have access to this asset or service on an as-needed, on-demand basis. So let's look at some numbers and uh, see where the sharing economy has been and where it is going. Uh, so this is based on a Price, Waterhouse and Cooper study that was done a few years ago 
uh, by polling a group, a uh, large number of customers who uh, benefited from and have used the sharing economy. So according to the studies done, one of the driving forces of the sharing economy is the changing perception of ownership. So those of you, the younger generation who are in the room, uh, probably are not, no longer interested in owning an asset. I know in the US, for example, nowadays many of the younger people do not want to have a driver's license. No, they don't want to drive because they want to be able to just, you know, I guess surfing the web is more fun than surfing the road. Right? You want to be able to surf the web and have somebody else drive the vehicle for you. So uh, the perceptions of ownership are changing quite a bit. Uh, so 81% agree that uh, the uh, uh, less experience to share goods than uh, to own the, them. So they prefer uh, sharing the experience than owning the product. And also about half of the population agreed that owning today feels like a burden. You know, if you own a product, especially if you're living in a larger city, let's say you own a vehicle, you have to pay for your parking, you have to pay additionally for your insurance, and half the time your vehicle is not being used, right? So that is an additional burden if you own a product. And also, more than half agree that this sharing is the new model for ownership as we move forward into the next generation. And uh, talking about the benefits of sharing, so these are some of the uh, results that we saw from the study. 86%, uh, which is a very large number of the population, agree that it makes life more affordable. You can have access to more services, more products, using more products, having more experiences by uh, benefiting from the sharing economy than purchasing or investing in buying those products. Uh, and 83% agree that it makes life more convenient and efficient. And also, this is an important point here, that 76% agrees that it is better for the environment and for sustainability. Okay? Because again, you're trying to uh, reduce the amount of uh, assets that are idling, that are not being used, versus trying to share and utilize those assets more effectively. Um, 78% agree that it is building a stronger community, which is an interesting point also. Uh, an interesting anecdote, uh, there was a time last year, I think, that my car was uh, had to be in the garage for a few weeks, and I ended up using Uber quite a lot. And each day you would ride uh, in an Uber taxi, and especially if you're interested in talking and you know socializing, you happen to meet so many different people with so many different backgrounds. You know, there might be an architect who is taking the day off driving your car, or it might be a taxi driver who has switched from uh, using a, driving a taxi to driving an Uber cab. So it does build a sense of community and networking, which is a very interesting point as well. Uh, and 63% agree it is more fun uh, than engaging with the traditional companies. And 89%, which is again a very large number, agree that it is based on trust. And this is an important point in the sharing economy because you are opening up your house or sharing your car or letting somebody use your couch that you have never seen before, right? So it de depends on trust between the partners and that is an important feature as well. So these are some of the factors that have uh, uh, driven the uh, sharing economy and we have seen a significant growth in the sharing economy in the last decade or so. So the landscape is full of different brand names uh, with sharing. I mean, I know we know some of these brands much better than the others. Some of them are global, others are local, but there are a lot of companies that are in the sharing space right now. Uh, but to take us one step deeper, let's look at two examples that most of us are familiar with. So let's start with vacation rentals, sharing space, or most of us are familiar with, you know, the most common ones are Airbnb, vacation rentals by owners, or home away, couch surfing, and there are a lot of brands that you can name. So uh, just to kind of get an idea of the impact of this uh, sharing uh, space, and what it has had on the traditional, let's say, uh, hotel industry. Let's look at some uh, numbers here from the impact the sharing economy has had uh, comparing Airbnb's, uh, uh, I think this, uh, it's hard to see the numbers from, uh, from afar. These are the hotel stays in 2014 that you see on the chart for Airbnb versus Hilton Worldwide. 
And as you can see, there have been more hotels, uh, room stays, by, taken up by Airbnb versus Hilton worldwide. Okay, so that's a significant difference. Hilton is a big chain, as we know, they have they operate in many countries at different levels. But that's a significant number to see. And this was in 2014. And since then, we know it, Airbnb has expanded quite a bit as well. Another example, right here. And this space is also very uh, crowded now. But uh, some of the better known companies, Uber, Lyft, uh, they operate in many countries. Uh, and here's another statistic that also kind of points us to some of the challenges or in, uh, effects due to this sharing economy in the right, right hailing service. Uh, this is, uh, these are some numbers from the New York City taxi industry. The chart on the left hand side shows the distribution of uh, vehicle usage uh, in the first quarter of 2014. And uh, the three colors are, if you are at the back, the green shows the taxi usage percentage, blue one is right hailing, red one is the uh, rental cars. So the rental cars were bring more than half the percentage, 50%, and this is the taxis, about 37, and right hailing was a very small percentage. If you look at the right hand side, right hailing is 70% when it comes to 2018 first quarter. And uh, if you look at the taxes, they have dropped to a mere six percent. Okay. So what do these numbers tell us? Looking at the hotel industry and the taxi industry, what we have seen is that the share.